Hi, everybody. It's Mary Rowe from the Canadian Urban Institute. Um, really pleased to be welcoming you here to this city talk that we're uh, putting together with uh, the support of the shift, um, which is whose focus is on um, uh, a human rights approach to home and housing. Um, this is a tough topic encampments and we've been watching across the country as once again, uh, uh, challenges around urban life manifest in these kinds of informal kinds of settlements that that appear and cause all sorts of challenge uh, for different folks in different kinds of ways. And uh, people that are in the encampments, people that are living next to them, all the different ways I was suggesting in the uh, uh, sound check that the reason this is such an important topic for us at the Urban Institute is that it, it magnifies and amplifies some of the fundamental disconnections that we've got happening in Canadian cities and cities around the world, but here in Canada. And some of this predates COVID. Uh, and uh, these are conditions and challenges and disconnections that have, have been present in cities for a period of time. And now during COVID, they just become much more exacerbated as we know. So um, CUI is a national organization. We're in the connective tissue business. We've been focusing on what's working, what's not, and what's next through COVID. And uh, as I suggested, really important to us to hear from people with direct experience um, about different aspects of urban life. Um, we're, uh, as I said, national, and people are coming in on this across the country, and they have uh, they operate on different ancestral lands, uh, all of which are part of the reckoning that we're doing as urbanists and as settlers uh, to understand our relationship to the land that was actually uh, historically attached uh, and continues to be the ancestral lands. In our case of the Wendat, the Mississaugas of Credit, uh, the Chippewa, uh, the Haudenosaunee, and uh, we're covered by a couple of treaties in, in Toronto, but each of these folks are gonna talk specifically about their experience and they're um, uh, coming to understand what the reality of truth and reconciliation looks like. And I think that uh, this is a struggle for urbanists because we've had exclusionary urban practices for so long uh, that just became part of how we all operated. And now we have to dismantle those things and try to figure out how do we go forward and next, uh, what does the next look like? Uh, and can we build uh, return to, not return to what was, but actually create different kinds of uh, uh, opportunities that cities provide for people? Can they do that in a more inclusive and a more just way? So thanks for everybody that's come on. Um, we'd encourage you to come into the chat and offer your, uh, first of all, tell us where you're coming in from. That's always interesting for us to see where people are listening from. Uh, in the encampment uh, situation is present in almost every city in Canada. Uh, it's, it's present in towns, it's in small towns, it's in some cases, it's in rural environments. So there are all sorts of different understandings of this, how we got to this, and now what do we do? So uh, to start off, uh, we're appreciative that we have people coming in, as I suggested, from not only different parts of the country, but different perspectives. And each person here is gonna offer some of their own personal and uh, their own visceral experience of this. What are they seeing? What are they, what's their experience in Cammons? Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about what do we think some of the alternative solutions are to getting uh, forward, uh, to move forward from it. There is closed captioning if you'd like to take advantage of that. Uh, I seem to have it on my screen, but I have no idea why I do, but I think there's a button you can press that allows you to use closed captioning if you prefer. Um, People have different uh, access to the internet across the country. So we appreciate if people want to just come in and listen, that's fine too. Uh, and I'm going to go first to Tina, if I could. Uh, the the um, names of everybody that's on here and their affiliations are in the chat. So you can uh, learn about that there. Uh, mm -hmm. And Tina, if I could just start with you, just give us a couple minutes on your particular perspective and experience on encampments. And tell us also what city you're in or what part of the country you're in. Okay, again, hi, I'm Tina Dawson. Um, I'm from Victoria, BC. I'm 52 years old. Uh, this has been my first experience being homeless. I was born and raised in Victoria. Uh, COVID hit. Um, unfortunate things happened. I ended up in Central Park. Well, we had a flood, a massive flood. Therefore, things had to happen and happen fast. And thank God for everything that did happen. We were placed up in a parking lot and it sounds terrible, but it worked. We were, to, I was told by bylaw here that we would have two weeks maximum, this would work. Well, we were there four months. And this was community inside run. We had minimal outside um, intervention. It went and it went well. Um, the only reason that we were we moved was because Tiny Town moved into where we were. Um, 
at where we were at Central, this was commonly known to flood out. We were placed in spots where there was no way to get, uh, you were either going down with the mud or you were going to have a foot of water below. So this was pre-known, this, this knew this would happen. But what they were doing was taking the leaves that fell and putting them over the drains. So I don't know, but if it wasn't for um, the, our mayor, um, North Park um, residential housing and um, a lot of other people's reasonings why of moving us and helping us, but we were on hardscape. We put down pallets and wood. We were supplied with tents, new cots, because everything was damaged or lost. Um, I ended up in the position of being the, the management, managing the area. We had other people doing that. Now we were doing that on our own. You give people pride in their own that works very well. Uh, it worked. We had very little problems. Um, I, I just, um, my, I'm, I'm, as being fair, new homeless, I am gobsmacked at the way things are, is out of sight, out of mind. And the machine that's in place to keep people homeless. How, how on earth am I going to get out of this position where I've managed my entire life, raised three children, now where I have number one, no address that I can use. Number two, the problem with damage deposit. I'm on disability, I'm on permanent disability. That's hand to mouth. Um, I was placed into supportive housing, which I'm finding out is gonna be closing in March. Now, if COVID hadn't happened, none of this would have happened. Mm -hmm. It would be the seven to seven. And again, I said, when there's a machine in place to keep homeless people homeless, you try mm -hmm. to do a job in finding a home when you have to protect your stuff all day. Yeah. Uh, again, where you live, how are you going to? My partner was working at the time, working a good job. He had to take time off and now he has no job because he did not, was not able to get his sleep. His, it was very physically hard work. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it was impossible for him to be safe at work and safe for other people mm -hmm. when he was sleep deprived. Yeah. So it's, 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 there's a lot of things that need to happen, but they can happen. Yeah. So, so it, 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 we're going to get to solutions. Let's, I'm going to keep getting everybody to just sort of give us their perspective, but it, it's sort of, as you say, it cascades, right? One oh, problem leads to the right. next problem. Leads to, all of a sudden you don't have any rest. So how long were you in the encampment, Tina? Um, we were at the, the RAP 940 Caledonia for four months. Okay. So prior, prior to that, I was at Central for six. Um, and, and now we were, then we went to the arena the same mm -hmm. arena mm -hmm. uh, there for just over two, almost three months now mm -hmm. i'm at the howard johnson on gorge road east mm -hmm. and, um, and this has all been during covid and you've had and it's it interesting for me too to hear your comments about how you kind of self-organized in yeah. you know you kind of found a way to kind of solve it it's it, this this is one of the interesting things about these informal settlements you know around the world they exist too and they, they can be high functioning actually, right? Yeah. But the, yeah, but the, but the dilemma, as you say, is that it's so transient, then you get moved out, then you gotta go to this, then you gotta go to that. Yeah, right. okay. I was still at the encampment where I would like to be because again, it was more home than where uh -huh. I am. If we could organize something like that, where we are indoors. Yeah. I, there needs to be more involvement from the, the living, the people that are- Who experience it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and as you say, you've got capacity to be able to figure it out and organize it as you would. Yeah. Okay. Let me now, if I could, I'm going to go to the other part of the country. Andrew, I'm going to go to you next, if I could. Uh, we're going to go from uh, Victoria now to Toronto. Andrew, can you give us your perspective on this? And then I'm going to swing back to the West. We're just going to traverse the country. Go to you, Andrew. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, Mary, I mean, I think, you know, again, and thanks for you know, Tina's 
points is just sort of writing down everything that, you know, has been said about this machine. You know, I think in terms of the system that has been in place and the systemic discrimination that has played out with respect to homelessness across the country um, is something that I think, again, Tina raising um, so powerfully uh, is something that I think we've been grappling with, obviously, this part in Toronto for a long time. Um, you know, I'd speak from you know, my own vantage point as someone who is involved in the health system as one of the, the co-leads in the Toronto region response for the pandemic uh, as a primary care physician and someone who works at uh, the University Health Network. And, you know, when I look back at where we were, and I mean, it, it's been hard because we really haven't had the chance to reflect uh, on what this last 18 months has meant. It has been about survival. And you look at what Tina and her partner and family and community have had to do. That was the sense, especially when you go back to think how we were all feeling in mm-hmm. March 2020. And there are times where I try to go back to channel that feeling and reflect in terms of just in how much disarray, the uncertainty that was there, the uncertainty that we still have around what this future is going to look like, the pandemic. But also, again, as we're seeing numbers and data and losses mount when it comes to uh, the overdose crisis, to what we've been seeing in terms of, you know, the cascade, Mary, that I think you spoke to, there's a cascade effect that has been playing out for the 18 months. And some of it has been on the radar like never before, but too much of it has not been. And so when I look at my own, again, experience of some of the work in shelters, seeing what's been, you know, playing out, I think there's been a lot of effort to try to make places safer in the um, backdrop of as what Tina's mentioned, the machine of systemic discrimination that has take place where people who are surviving homelessness, not just experiencing it, um, have been shut out so violently. And we've tried, I think there's been efforts with the health system and other partners and community partners um, to try to do the work which we did around testing and vaccine rollouts uh, in shelters as early on as we could here in Toronto. I know other cities have had some excellent success as it's rolled out relative uh, to the to the vaccine piece, but there's only so much that can be done when you look at the real chronic inequities that have been playing out. And I think, Mary, when we're looking at this situation, it's it's even hard now when thinking about a fourth wave. I mean, I went back to March to think about what that first wave was feeling like, but knowing that there's still uncertainty for people who have done all they could to take care of each other through these last three waves, um, building every sense of community. And now I think it's really on us in terms of both the health system, society, public policy makers, uh, how are we going to start to mobilize things that we know needed to take place and especially around housing, affordable housing and supportive housing to take place at a pace we haven't seen before. But I would just leave it with this, that I mean, there are things that we were told in the healthcare system could never be done or would take an incredible amount of time, but things happened at a pace to, to respond to the pandemic. And I hope that that same sense of urgency continues across every level of government as we know how dire the situation is for people. Yeah, I mean, it's this, this notion that things have become visible. I mean, uh, Tina, you said it, it, we were out of sight or things are out of sight. And Andrew's saying, well, actually, we've known about this stuff forever. So, or at least for a number of years. It's interesting whether encampments may be the, may be the visible thing that shocks people into realizing, oh, gee, maybe, maybe it will make the problem visible enough. I, I'm interested to hear from Mayor Helps. Can we go to you now, Mayor Helps? Um, your perspective is, uh, and I'm appreciative here that we have people here in very different roles. So Lisa helps as a mayor. Let's hear your perspective if we could. Sure. Well, just want to thank uh, Tina for saying yes when I asked her to join, because really she's an amazing gal and has had some um, really transformational uh, effect on people's lives here in Victoria. Um, so just to give you some the, the shock that everyone's talking about from, from our perspective, um, before, so March 18th, 2020, approximately, pre-COVID hitting here, we had about 24, our staff are very, between 25 and 35 tents in parks on a regular basis because there were indoor shelters and people were couch surfing and shelter capacity was high or people were staying with relatives. Fast forward, and this this is a shocking statistic, fast forward to April 24th, 2020, and the outdoor structure count had swelled to 465. 
just like that in a month because people were put out of shelters, they were put out of relatives' homes, they, whatever, wherever they were coming from, they were they were outside in the middle of a pandemic at the end of winter. And so we mobilized really quickly. Um, I'm a bit pushy as people who know me will know. And I just gathered everyone together at one o'clock every day, health, housing, anyone who had anything to do with this provincial staff every day at one o'clock I said what have you done in the last 24 hours and what are you going to do in the next 24 hours and we mobilized um, again the province deserves a lot of credit um, and by the end of May uh, about 400 people had moved inside to various locations the arena Tina mentioned um, motels and so on but then by October we were up to another 400 people because more people lost their homes and so then from October until the end of this May um, we worked and, and Tina was included in this um, with people to find uh, adequate indoor sheltering spaces. And so really for us in Victoria, in, in addition to, you know, supporting small business and making sure that vaccinations were happening, really it's been a story of displacement, um, of trauma, uh, of people living in really unstable conditions. And then as Tina says, not knowing what's going to happen next. And we've, we've done, uh, you know, our very best given the tools and resources that we have as local government. And, and I, those, those daily meetings turned into weekly meetings. And every Friday at 10, I'd say, what have you done for the last week? What are you doing for the next week? Until everybody was moved from outside to inside. But what we learned along the way, and I'm, I've asked Gala from my office, she'll send the link and I'll put it in the chat. We commissioned a report um, by a brilliant woman named Nicole Shaland, and she went and spent time with people living in parks and asked them what's wrong, what's not working. So even though in Victoria, we did a pretty good job uh, moving people inside uh, into more safe circumstances, there's a lot of work still to do to improve the homeless serving system so that it puts people at the center so that it uh, involves people in the decisions that they need to make just like Tina said and Tina's staying at a motel where there isn't a peer support program or a peer um, led program but at another one the travel lodge there is and it's amazing it's they've got a whole group of people who are paid to curate their own experience and so we've applied to funding uh, at the province to get those kinds of programs set up peer led peer supported in all of the temporary housing sites so I'll leave it there there's a lot more to say but I'm um, really grateful Mary for you to convene this conversation. Lisa, it kind of begs the question, though, which is both Andrew and Tina were hinting at, which is, does it take a crisis like this for municipal government to move swiftly? I mean, you went to daily meetings, I guess, because you had to, right? But are there, are there impediments to this kind of rapid response? You know, the trivial example that's offered is that advocates for bike lanes spent years trying to get bike lanes. We're told it would take forever and forever. And then suddenly we have bike lanes. And I, that's criticized as a kind of a trivial example because it doesn't affect that many people's lives. But does it take something like this for you to be able to get the focus and the attention of your colleagues to actually solve it? No, it doesn't take this for municipal governments. Municipal governments have been working around the clock on housing and homelessness. We've had a community plan to end homelessness. We are mobilized and we you know, can't tell you how many meetings I've had about this in the last six and a half years. What it takes is that visible presence for senior levels of government to think, oh my goodness, we better invest some money here. If we had all the money in the world as local governments, we could get people housed within the next three to five years. I know that sounds like a long time, but give us all the resources and we can end, we can get to functional zero, which is now where we're mobilizing. But I think what it did is, you know, I, again, whatever, there's a lot to say, but uh, it, it, the province couldn't get away with leaving people outside in tents. Yeah. They can, they can get, they can, and I'm not meaning our, our province, our provincial government is very awesome. And, but it, they can kind of get away with leaving people couch serving. They can get away with leaving people with relatives. But when all of those people end up on boulevards, uh, it, it, as Tina says, it, it's it's impossible to ignore. And so our provincial government has been spending a lot of money over the years uh, on housing of the, the BC NDP. They're doing a great job. But this really did did galvanize everybody in, in a way that hadn't happened before. And the good thing is here, we haven't stopped. We're not slowing down. We're, you know, we've got very high vaccination rates. Lots of people like the pandemic is you know, there'll probably be a fourth wave, but but now the, the, the mobilization around housing is not slowing down. So that's a, a good thing, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I hear you on this. I mean, there's still so much uncertainty, but I, I feel like it's incumbent on those of us working in urban life that no more excuses, right? That we this is, we're, we've, we've had a reckoning here, a global reckoning, 
And if we don't come out of this making changes, systemic changes, what the hell's wrong with us, right? Uh, okay, I'm going to go to you, Yuha, and you study these things. Yuha's coming into us from Finland, giving us a bit of a perspective uh, based on his uh, uh, analysis and his work around the world. So over to you, Yuha, in a different jurisdiction. Shed some light on this for us, can you? Thank you. Uh, I have always thought that there are a lot of similarities between Canada and Finland, but this seems to be an issue where we also have great differences uh, because I really can't recall that we have had any homeless encampments in this century. When I started to work with homelessness in, in the 1980s, they were in Helsinki and around Helsinki in the metropolitan area. There were some places where homeless people used to gather that you could call encampments. But what's significant was that at the same time, we had a lot of shelters and hostels, a lot of shelter and hostel beds. So shelters were not the solution to, to people sleeping rough. And, and what has really changed, because our policy is based on, on the idea that housing is a basic social right, uh, is that in 2008, we started a national program and policy based on housing first, which meant but also the, the, most of the rest of shelters and hostels were renovated into supported housing where everybody has their own flat with their own rental contract and they can have support also if they need it. And it's also, I think it's important to understand the, the importance of, of the lived or living, living experience. Uh, in Finland, we already had in, in 1987, uh, an NGO formed by homeless people themselves. And it has been a very important organ in advocating the, the views of the homeless people. And the message from homeless people living, experiencing homelessness has always been that it has to be a permanent housing, a safe place, not a shelter or, or a hostel. And so since 2008, our policy has been based on this principle that providing permanent housing on rental contract and support if, if that's needed. And I think that this is the, the only way how, how you can find a solution to, to homelessness. Uh, in Finland, it has been a national policy and it has been a very wide partnership between the state, the government, local authorities, cities and NGOs working both on a national and local level. But of course, in, in practice, the, the, the greatest responsibility is on the cities. But, but of course, the state can provide the legal framework and also financing that's, that's needed. But the cities are the active actors. And we have homeless people represented in international programs in the steering groups. And they are taking part in, in planning the services in, in the cities. And, and I think that it's, it's really proved out to be a, a, a very pragmatic and, and successful way to, to work. Maybe that's all at, at this point. It's Thanks. interesting you have the model you're talking about. The, the uh, tenant, the, the, the person moving into the unit, sounds like they have a lot of, they're empowered by this. They have a lot of choice, right? They're signing. I mean, this is, I think, part of what I was hearing from Tina was, but wait a sec, I wanna have, want have some agency, some engagement here. And, uh, and sometimes an informal settlement allows them that, whereas the big you know, crank and system that is full of bureaucratic problems may not. Um, Jennifer, can we hear from you now? Yes, absolutely. Great. Um, so I am a 51 year old disabled woman who has been experiencing homelessness. I lost my housing 18 months ago. Um, I lived in a park for four months and have been trying to survive in one of the shelter hotels in the city of Toronto for the last eight months. Um, and I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, the city's narrative that it's unsafe to live in parks and that it's much safer to live in here. Right now, I have a friend sleeping in a wheelchair because two nights ago, he fell off his bed in his sleep. His head got wedged under a thing and he lay there for 12 hours before they find him, found him. Um, and you know, he's in my room so I can make sure that, that he stays okay. Mm -hmm. Um, the cases aren't safe. We also do not have 
uh, peer support program here for people who, who OD and people that were dying here every single week. They were only starting to gear up at a problem like that. And I think one of the communities that is almost always left out of talking about homelessness and poverty and housing are disabled people. Mm -hmm. I was on the waiting list for wheelchair accessible housing for 15 years. And the yeah. only way for me to get a unit is if somebody dies or moves to a hospital or long term care or if they build it. And for as much as the city of Toronto keeps claiming there's no money to give us housing, it is costing them $6,600 a month per person per hotel. Right. So that's $42,000, which is three years of rent. Um, and, you know, they're, they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars moving the police in and violently evicting people from parks. Mm -hmm. And for me, I was safe living in the park. Um, both from other residents of the park, as well as the home to people that lived around us. We had, there was so much kindness and support. And in the last 18 months, it was the only part of my existence that wasn't, that wasn't just trauma. It was the only place where I was actually able to heal to survive being homeless. And for a lot of us, a lot of us, it simply comes down to not being able to afford a place to live. Um, many people are already aware of this, but for ODSP, which is Ontario Disability, the maximum rent allowance is $497. Um, 20 years ago, it was $416. And that is all that's gone up in that time. The city of Toronto is opening up rent subsidies to us, but you have to be deemed chronically homeless to be, to be eligible. And their definition of chronically homeless is six months of living in through the shelter system or outside. And I have a friend here who had a rent subsidy, but his housing workers told him that he had to leave because it was unsafe housing. And then he found out that the subsidy was affordable. So he's here for six months just to reapply for that. There's no need for him to be homeless. There's no need for many of us to be homeless. And the city of Toronto is, is not doing anything to change the situation here. Um, like I said, there are so many deaths here and there are so many people, people talk to me on a daily basis about the trauma they're going through. And I am I have a therapist at my doctor's office, not from the trauma of being homeless and what I've gone through, but specifically just from living here in, in, this, in this shelter hotel. Yeah. Jennifer, are you saying you felt safer in the park? Yes, yes. And I'm immunocompromised. So even mm -hmm. without COVID, I cannot go into concrete shelter settings. Yeah. And I, I have really great medical care and I spoke to my doctor before going to the park. She said it was the safest available option, that it was safer for me living outside in a park than it mm -hmm. was in the culture mm -hmm. You know, there's this, there's this term in urban planning around desire paths, which I'm sort of in love with, which is when people don't go the way that the planners think they should go and they decide that they're going to make their path somewhere else. And I, I keep wondering whether encampments are telling us something about how people want to live, you know, and the, because it, and you, Tina described it too, you can self-organize, you have some autonomy, you have some flexibility, all those things. But on the other side, I know there's anxiety that, that, that people in municipal government have about safety and other things. So Donnie, if I can call on you next, and then I'll go to you, Donnie. Um, yeah, go, go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah. Want to add in? Yeah. Toronto has, has been saying that the fire safety is their main reason for moving us out. I'm disabled. When I first came here, they put me on the 15th floor and I booked an appointment with medical staff. The second day I was here, I told them if there was a fire, I'd be left behind. And when there was a fire, they left me behind and they left behind any of the other people in the building too disabled to use the stairs. And I yeah. thought it was and they still refuse to move me to a lower floor. Many of these places are not wheelchair accessible. They don't have accessible facilities. They don't have staff trained in home care. Um, yeah. It needs to change. Yeah. I mean, the deficiencies of the system are just so glaring, eh? When you're there in the middle of it. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, well, this is what I'm querying is, are the, I mean, I'm also hearing though, you said, quite clearly that you've been on a waiting list for way too long for space that would have been accessible to you. So there's obviously a supply question too. Okay, well, these trade-offs are the thing I'm struggling with. We're, we're really gonna try to see if we can talk about what do we do with encampments? What do encampments tell us, I guess? So Donnie, can I come to you next? Sure, thanks very much, Mary. Uh, my name is Donnie Roosevelt, pronouns are me and she, and I'm joining you from the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam and Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, I, uh, I'm the general manager of the Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation, 
And uh, uh, the Park Board is uh, an independently elected body, the only kind um, of its kind in Canada. And so we have, uh, they have jurisdiction over uh, parkland. Um, so for us to, for, for me to come on this call, I, I, I have no uh, homelessness experience in terms of formal experience in housing. Um, I do have lived experience. I have lived experience working in a decampment uh, at the decampment of Strathcona Park. Um, I have a community development uh, background really. And I think it served me well in uh, approaching the Strathcona encampment um, I've been with the park board 10 months now. So when I joined, uh, there was uh, Strathcona Park was already an encampment and had been uh, reached its uh, peak of 500 tents or so. Um, and, and I had joined at about day 140. Uh, this encampment lasted 347 days. Um, without, uh, I know we're going to get into some other things later, but essentially, um, it was critical to my board uh, for them to delegate authority to me to actually uh, move forward with this. It was critical uh, for them to see that I took a harm reduction, trauma-informed reconciliation approach. And, and uh, you know, honestly, I was learning it as I was going. And uh, to Emily and Drew, I'm still learning it as I go. Uh, we still have an encampment uh, happening at, and we have folks living uh, hard um, all over Vancouver. It, the most important thing uh, to me was to make sure that we were working with the camp leadership uh, and the folks at the camp to ensure their safety um, and also then to have a coordinated approach with the province, with the city uh, and, and with the park board. Uh, but it had to be with the local community and it had to be with the community of residents living at the camp. And um, again, I was learning it as I went, but uh, working with folks, setting up peer programs to manage, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, warming tent, to manage the washrooms, to make sure people were safe, uh, to support um, their conversations and their engagement with the housing folks. Um, the province deserves a lot of credit in that they uh, stepped up and we worked very closely together um, to try to bring folks indoors the best possible. We know we had over 280 folks during that time uh, in a, in a, at the end in a short period who were um, brought indoors. As far as the condition of housing and the condition of, of um, SROs and stuff, that's way out of my bailiwick. Um, so my, my focus really um, is to bring those partners to the table, um, but also to do to, to approach this in the most caring and humane way. Um, and, and in the end, you know, when we had a deadline uh, to work toward, we worked with people and we didn't just say, okay, well, this is the date. We worked with people toward their individual goals. Um, not all of them were met, but many of them were, were met. And um, we didn't just, you know, we just didn't pull the plug and, and we tried to take that humane, I guess, approach to it. It's not perfect and there's lots of work to do still. Johnny, as you know, I see people in your role as like um, a steward, you know, like you're stewards of a public asset called a park, just like traffic people are stewards of streets, right? These are public assets or librarians are stewards of libraries. Do you see any role in parks for people who, who feel like they don't have their, have their housing choices? And, and elect to camp. Yeah. Uh, our bylaw allows people to camp overnight when there are no indoor spaces available. The trick to it is, or the, the crux of it is, is that during the day you have to pack up, which is pretty challenging for people. And I hear that and I know that, um, and I'm sort of stuck in the middle of that. Our board uh, wanted to make sure that people weren't just moved from park to park to park. And that's why the encampment stayed there as long as it did, because we, uh, we connected with the province, we connected with the city, we, we drafted an MOU uh, that made sure that all three of us were at the table uh, working collaboratively. And it wasn't until then really that, um, that we saw some success. So, you know, is, is, is camping part of the housing continuum? 
that's for the, the housing folks to address for sure. Whoops. Well, we've got a few of them on the call here, so let's ask them. Uh, Leilani, I'm going to go to you, please, uh, to give your perspective, and then we're going to have sort of a general conversation, I guess, about uh, what we think the alternatives are uh, in terms of addressing encampments, what should happen next. Just want to once again plug the chat. As usual, City Talkers are devoted chat users, and they are posting all sorts of fascinating things there. We always collect the chat, and we post it, um, so just heads up you know, the old story, it doesn't stay in Vegas, it actually goes up on the website, because you all offer such important, smart things. So I'd encourage people to go into the chat, respond to each other as you're doing, and uh, make connections is terrific, and it, we benefit so much from doing that. Leilani, can I get your perspective, please, from the ship? Sure, sure. thanks, Mary. Um, thanks to all my co-panelists, but especially uh, Tina and Jennifer for telling us a little bit, and all we've seen is just a teeny little bit of your realities, but it's really helpful. It's always helpful to me. And um, to me, it's always the most important conversations I end up having people living, living and experiencing homelessness. Um, my uh, vantage on all of this is global uh, because I was the UN Special Rapporteur for six years and I made it a priority and an opportunity to meet with uh, people living in homelessness across the world, every country and every city that I visited. That was my priority. And um, what I learned was, of course, this is a global phenomenon, sadly. What I also learned, sadly, is that no matter the riches or wealth of a city or a nation, um, that actually doesn't indicate whether there will or will not be homelessness. Quite the contrary, actually, some of the, you know, the richer pla the, the places with the most wealth, uh, you end up seeing the most homelessness. California is a good example, fifth largest GDP in the world and a huge housing and homelessness crisis there. Um, what I also learned over time is that the experiences of Jennifer and Tina, for example, and of living in encampments really engages human rights. And it engages it in two ways. One way that most of us think about and one way that most of us don't. So the way that most of us understand living in encampments as engaging human rights is as a deprivation of human rights, right? I mean lack of access to a toilet, to showers, to water, to food, uh, to a place to store your personal belongings, to privacy, um, to, to be able to make your own decisions about your own life, right? All of that we understand as rights deprivations. Um, what we don't think about with respect to encampments and how they engage human rights is that in fact, um, encampments are, are a claim to human rights and a claim to the right to housing. And that once you understand that, there's a real richness there and it actually has to alter our understanding of encampments. So when someone pitches a tent in a park, that is their claim, that is their expression of their human right to housing. And, and, and so once we understand that, we might ask, oh, well, so what? Like, what's the value of human rights in all of this? Big deal. Um, I think, first of all, I mean, I'm just like a, I don't know, for me, I, I like logic, you know, a human rights issue should have a human rights response. That seems logical to me. Um, but I also think that human rights really change the way we view and understand people living in homelessness and homelessness as an issue and how to solve it. Um, we don't, once you understand that people living in homelessness are rights holders, that then means they're not just recipients of charity at best, and they're not criminals or encroachers or trespassers at worst, they're rights holders. And that means something. And it, what it means in particular is it engages accountability. So under a human rights framework, it's really clear who is accountable to whom. That's one of the things I love about human rights. Governments sign and ratify international human rights law and they make themselves accountable to people. So governments are accountable to people and it's, it's anyone exercising government authority. And Donnie knows that well and said that in their comments, um, right? So it's anyone exercising government authority. And um, what I like about human rights is it's really practical. Um, hopefully one of my colleagues will put in the chat a protocol. She has. Yeah, she has. I, yeah, so Dr. Caitlin Schwann and I co-authored a protocol on 
how to do encampments from a human rights point of view when you're a government official. How should you engage with the people living in encampments? And it's really practical. A lot of governments feel like, oh God, human rights, accountability, thorn in the side, obligations, feels heavy, you know, it sounds expensive. But in fact, a human rights approach is really practical. It says things like, you have to listen to Tina and Jennifer. You have to involve them in decisions that affect their lives. It talks about ensuring encampments are safe or as safe as possible, whether that's through a vaccine program, whether that's through providing water and sanitation, whether that's ensuring that the people in the encampment have the resources to organize themselves so that they can have an anti-oppression <laughs> mandate, etc. Uh, so I'll just I'll just stop there. Je you Jennifer, you just Jennifer put her camera on, which makes me think she wants to say something. Do you want to comment something on that, Jen? Um, no, actually. No, okay. Thank you. Um, no, it's okay. Um, I, I'm wanting to think about I mean, what Mayor Help said was uh, cities need more money. Municipalities need more, more money. And I think one of the challenges that you're suggesting about a human rights approach is it's housing continues to be sort of a hot potato in Canadian life where the provincial government and the federal government and the municipal government all kind of have a little role there. And who do we actually hold accountable? Lisa, what would you do? You're saying put, put the resources in the hands of municipalities and then get municipalities to affirm the human rights approach to housing and to encampments and everything else. Is that the solution? Uh, well, I don't know that there's any simple solution, but I, I do know. I mean, I don't think municipalities can be left to their own devices and, and because every political council or every council has its own flavor. But I think if, if for, for municipalities like Victoria that are willing, willing and others across the country, give us a whole load of money, hold us accountable for how many units we need to build by when, uh, accounting for escalating construction costs and so on, give us the money to give to peer-led organizations, because we can build all the housing we want, but if people don't feel like it's their home, if they don't feel that sense of community and belonging that they felt in an encampment, then we can build all the housing we want and it's not going to work. So it's more than, but yes, I think for willing local governments, and, and you know, in a sense, we are doing that a little bit in Victoria's Regional Housing First program, but there aren't the kinds of, and, and the report that I posted in the chat, we're going to implement these recommendations and transform the housing system here so it is person-centered, so we do take a human rights approach, but we, we do need funding from senior levels, and we are getting it. We are. But, know, what's it, but I think what's interesting, and I'm interested whether Andrew would comment on this, the dilemma is you're small. Victoria is 80,000 people, right? And you've been able to wrap your arms around this. I'm wondering if in, a, in some of the big larger centers, is there an impediment to the kind of reform we need? Andrew, are you experiencing that? I mean, you are the, you are at UHN, one of the largest health systems in the, in the world, probably. Is, it, is part of it that it's too big? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, mean I, I guess, you know, obviously in terms of where you know, Mayor Helps' vantage point from Victoria. I mean, I think in terms of the question, is it too big? Is this too insurmountable? No, I mean, I agree. I think we need every level of government to come together to solve this challenge. I, I think it's hard for me, as you mentioned, Mary, being at University Health Network, uh, being in the health system, and continuing to talk about universal health care when people are denied the basic human basic. right, human right to right. housing. There's no way we can talk about universal health care, universal access, when tens of thousands of people do not have access to housing. And right. to me, this has to start to upend the narrative of, yes, we talked about the human rights approach, and it's incredibly powerful and important on this in terms of the commitments that have been made, but as well about this from a public health and health perspective that is incredibly damaging. It is impossible to be talking about universal health care in, in, in light of this. And again, I think as the, the points made from Tina and Jennifer about how visible this is, how much suffering and hurt there has been, needs to be part of this narrative of we cannot rest on any laurels about talking about the universal healthcare system. I mean, I find it to be a very strange ethic in our country that we are fine, you know, and, and, and celebrate ourselves for saying anyone who needs an MRI or needs to stay for a week in the hospital can, and I think that's important, but that's tens of thousands of dollars, but we have some aversion to people being able to have the human dignity and access to housing to actually be able yeah. to gain the health outcomes and well-being that they want. And so I think that's the piece from a healthcare perspective. Yeah, yes, you know, this is large. Yes, it's a big city in Toronto, but we're not alone in what we've been facing. In other cities, 
of equal size or larger have been able to do a different job of partnering um, and ensuring that we are going to need all levels of government to address this as a real crisis, as, as I think so many have spoken to and who, so many in the room. I mean, the advantage that local leaders have is that you, you're looking at the crisis right on your doorstep and uh, the other governments are further away. Um, Jennifer, you ran a bunch of numbers. You've got the numbers down, 4,200 this, 42,000 that. So yep. you've done an analysis of what the costs are. So the system seems to put you into a, a solution that's not suitable for you, but also costs more money, right? Yeah, like you said, so per person, per hotel shelter in the city of Toronto, it is 6,600 a month. That pays for the space, the food, wraparound supports, although there are not a lot of that. It pays for the medical staff, the security, the community support workers. Yeah. Um, and for those of us who are on OW or ODSP, well, we are homeless. We do not receive the rent portion of our check. There's no way for us to save enough money to get right. ahead. And they are spending so much money everywhere but housing. The city of Toronto has created what they refer to as their action plan to have 10,000 um, affordable units built by 2030. Um, and every single time that the city of Toronto mentions building housing, they, re they refer to, to ad they use the word adequate. And, you know, adequate housing, it's not safe. It's not wheelchair accessible. Right. It's not the wraparound supports that people need. Right. And it's, it's not that complicated a situation. Um, for a lot of us, it just comes down to we can't afford rent. Um, me personally, because I have been homeless for over six months, I qualify for a rent subsidy on top of disability. And even I, I responsibly paid my rent for 30 years. Um, but we've yet to find a landlord that said yes to me, even though the way the subsidies work is that money goes direct to them. Um, right to them. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are two housing workers here and nobody's getting housed. Um, and... I think it's really important to change public perception of what's actually going on in these spaces versus what the city of Toronto says is going on. Yeah. Um, like I, I'm listed as refusing housing three times. None of those places were wheelchair accessible. Yeah. But, so, yeah. so you had a good, you had a good reason to refuse. Yeah. 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 But, but as you, you say, the, the statistic won't show that. And as you're saying, we've got to try to put a human face on this and for people to hear the actual stories, Tina, you started us on that path in terms of, your experience where suddenly you found yourself in an encampment. And, but it also sounded to me like that initial experience in the encampment was empowering for you. You kind of got some, you got some stuff happening, right? Yeah. So and, uh, the, again, about costs, uh, the, the arena per month costs $280,000 for the rent and the insurance. Uh, prep, uh, it was a drop in the bucket at the encampment. Now, when I've been placed over into the hotel, the doctors that are monitoring there, I have never been more sick than when I have moved into this hotel. I have had staphylococcus, MRS, yeah. cellulitis. It's infested with mice. Um, moved into the room, there were needles under the register. They were not cleaned. The floors have not been cleaned. Yeah, I mean, we. I mean, if anything, we've learned during COVID, it's that congregate living in a whole bunch of different circumstances right. puts people at risk, right? Yeah, that's right. I was much safer, much healthier in the encampment. Yeah. And again, when did we lose the, the taking care of each other, families taking care of families? When did that stop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I have yeah. been blessed with having people that are around me to become my family. I'm a product of the ministry. I was raised with a permanent ward. Mm -hmm. I do not have a family to pull, fall back on. Right. I, my children who, God thank, they're doing, my two daughters are doing fine mm -hmm. now. And uh, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of, I, I, I just, um, as I said, I wish I could just close my eyes to even what was to be better and in some ways, yes, I'm inside, but that's it. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, how do we extract uh, the good from each circumstance seems to have a couple of positives you want to hang on to, but then some other negatives, right? I think, I think it's with the, just like anybody else who's living where they live should have a say in, in what is done. Mm -hmm. I would like to have seen at least me moving into somewhere that was clean. Yeah, 
Well, and where you, yeah, and where you had someone to go to to say this isn't this is not clean, right? Yeah, you did a better job it's keeping your me. cancer clean. I, if I did, it would be like too bad out the door. Yeah. So uh, I'm wondering if in the last couple of minutes we've got about ten minutes left, and again the chat is full of all sorts of ideas, and people are making appointments to see each other and problem solve. And I appreciate how much people are self organizing, even in the chat. Um, you hot over to you. Um, you know, if we're talking about a continuum approach. Every person on this call has talked about a rights approach fundamentally, um, making sure that you do the math as Jennifer and, and Tina have had to do. They could do the math really clearly and say, look, it's much more cost effective to do it this way. Lisa is saying give resources to municipalities so that they can actually deploy them in the most effective way because they can see on the ground what's going on. Donnie was part of a process where she stewarded in collaboration with the stakeholders, a kind of collective solution where everybody had some kind of a say. And then Andrew was identifying there's some fundamental inadequacies in terms of how we actually provide universal anything in this country. So it's, this is a, a both a big macro challenge, but it's also a hyper micro challenge because I have an encampment six blocks from my apartment. When you look at the continuum in Europe, do you think that 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 is a possible way, a kind of, is that a way to move in partnership together that we that we can still have these kinds of encampments but make them safer, but have a, put the continuum in place? Would that be a reasonable focus for all of us? What do you suggest? Well, I think that the thing is to work in a very pragmatic way. Okay. And there has been also a lot of talk about, about the, the money. Uh, of course, there's, there's a need for money. There are a lot of different ways how you can use that money. Yep. And the, the national program that we had, it, the, the financing was divided between the state and the municipalities, 50-50, and that worked quite well. But there's also other, other financial incentives, like uh, the cities are obliged to provide at least 25% of all new housing to be affordable social housing. And to do that, they also get from the state uh, financing for their infrastructure investments. So this is there's a final in incentive for, for cities to make sure that they have this 25% always, the big cities. Which means that in Finland every year there's around eight to 9,000 new affordable social housing plots, which is the most important structural element to prevent people becoming homeless. So always it's 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 also financially viable and it's it's the it's a cost effective way to provide permanent housing for people not keeping them as as homeless uh, it, it's so self evident I, I, it's difficult for me to to think another way so but the but the prag, but the pragmatic approach is a good guide for us i think so we yeah. be pragmatic we have encampments let's be yeah. pragmatic we can yes. see that we have them. Then we have um, systemic issues around how mm -hmm. disability benefits are, are yes. arranged, what our actual supply chain looks like. I'm hearing that. I'm hearing that we've got healthcare disconnections and how do we actually provide universal healthcare because it, and then income support, which people are suggesting on the chat, this is a lot about cash and access to dough. Yeah. If we yeah. were to take some other practical steps, Donnie, what would you, based on your experience, I'm gonna go around and ask each person this, is there a pragmatic, let's use Yuha's language, are there a couple of pragmatic steps that you think we should take over the next 60 days, let's say? First to you, Donnie. Thanks. Um, first of all, I think get the right people to the table. Um, one of the things we've done is have um, a, a project manager who actually was able to treat this as we have to stay focused, we have to project, and we had an excellent one who was able to bring all the right players and then hold us all accountable in the way that we needed to, to be. So get the right person, get the right people to the table, and then appoint a project manager whose job it is is to is to figure out what the right solution is. Thank you, Andrew. What would your pragmatic steps be? Yeah, you know, I, I think one in terms of the points have been have been made, and so powerfully, I think in terms of ensuring that people with lived experience are informing the process and the engagement of what's currently happening and the encampments in the communities and informing the rest of the system already in terms of what is happening around homelessness. I mean, we say this in healthcare that we need people with lived experience and we try to do so and have to do so. And I think that's been a real step forward for healthcare to have people with lived experience 
inform how healthcare is delivered. We need to ensure that's happening with how the engagement's happening over the next you know, 60 days and the community leaders and peer workers and people that have mentioned around how to ensure that there really is and continue to be a trauma-informed uh, human rights, public health approach to this across the country for the next 60 days. And then I think as the points have been there about elections and political cycles, I'm not a political pundit, but it's incredibly clear that given we've come out of this pandemic, we need to see housing and income inequality treated as the crisis that they are, and this be an issue for every level of government uh, to come together on, hopefully in the next you know, very, very short stretch. Okay, so it becomes a kind of, as you suggest, a visible reminder, a visible prioritization around housing and income inequality. Jennifer, you had a couple of pragmatic things. What would you suggest? Sorry about that. Um, they need to prioritize um, their their approach to encampments. And the primary thing is they need to engage with the people who are actually almost and living in parks or in the shelter system as to how best to help us. We all have individual needs. Um, but, you know, the overall plans will work for a lot of different people. And I think those need to be in place. Um, but then when it comes to each individual person, we need to be working with most of us know what we want and we know what we need and it's simply not being provided. And there's so much energy here with the uh, municipal government. They consistently vote down any, any motions that have been brought forward to try and get them to engage with people in encampments who, as, as other participants have already said, like, you know, when we're in our parks, we have communities, we have a network, like the organizations come in and help us. There's so many non-government run resources out there for us already and you know we just need to be allowed to organize that and the government should be going to these organizations who have been doing this literally for decades as, yeah. as, as themselves because we know what it is we need and we know what's not working and it's been said again and again and again and and nobody's listening you know um and I just the amount of poverty for is staggering. Um, yeah, it's overwhelming, isn't it? It's overwhelming. And, yeah. and there's no way out of that. I'm, I'm homeless because I'm disabled. Yeah, um, as you say, it, it, this is, I think you've really identified this so clearly, this kind of cyclical gets worse, gets worse cascade. Yeah. Tina, a couple practical, pragmatic things. What would you suggest? I'd, I, would, I would suggest <laughs> what's already suggested is putting um, more power into the un, the homeless, the unhoused hands, more suggestions, listening, okay. listening to all of our individual. And I would find that probably our individual problems would be, pro a lot of them would be everybody's same problem is giving back dignity, self-worth. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so focus on the individual. Um, this, what Jennifer just said, a kind of a case management approach where every person has a plan. And then as you're suggesting, Tina, it's got to be respectful of the person's circumstance and their choices, right? And their capacity and, to make and choices. Hand ups, not handouts. Yeah. Yeah, 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 got it. Lisa, pragmatic, what would you suggest? Well, two things. One is for all of us, there's a federal election coming up, definitely. And we need to make housing the ballot question um, and all the things in the chatter. So there's some really good policy recommendations. But what we're doing in Victoria is our, our approach during COVID wasn't perfect. Um, Tina has uh, showed us a lot of the reasons that it, that it wasn't. Um, we did our best, uh, but we know that we can do better. And so we commissioned a report. Uh, it's in the chat probably twice. There are 28 recommendations. Um, so we've already turned it into a work plan. It's really boring, but this is what mayors do. We make work plans. Um, and the whole uh, orientation is to make it person-centered. The, the report, this report, I really ask everyone to read it. It's based on the experiences of seven people who lived in parks. And we took their, Nicole took their feedback and she made some improve, some recommendations for system improvements. And so in the next 60 days, we've already started, we're gonna implement these 28 recommendations uh, to make our system here person-centered and uh, rights-based. So, that, so that's what we're doing. And again, it's, it's about the CRD, this report, but there's tons of stuff in there that are applicable in every city and jurisdiction across this, Canada, across this country. Well, I look forward to reading it. Thanks, uh, Lisa, for telling us about that. Um, Yuha, you, you suggested some pragmatic things. Do you have a few to answer? And then I'm going to go to you, Leilani. Any additional thing from you, Yuha, pragmatic that you think we should focus on? Well, 
I, I think that there has been already proposed very good ideas and, and it's extremely important to, to get homeless people involved and, and really, mm -hmm. really listen to their voice. That's, mm -hmm. that's the basic thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lilani, pragmatic things for the next 60 days. What would you say? Obviously, completely agree with what you had just said. Um, I actually think what I see in governments around Canada is um, a timidity around bold, creative moves that are value based. And I, I think now's the time. And we've seen some of it. I mean, Mayor Helps has done some really interesting things, creating new relationships with people, communicating directly with people. That's bold for a mayor to put herself out there like that. And I like that. The, the, and if you think about Finland as a country, not just on the homelessness file, but in so many ways, so much of what makes Finland at the top in many areas is because they think so creatively to address their problems. And I feel that lacks a little bit in Canada. I have to say, okay. I think we need some bold creativity. I think that now's the moment. So as we've been saying, guys, through gals, but gals, through COVID, you know, if, if not now, when, and enough is enough. And now's our moment where we have to actually recreate and be commit to the cities that we really believe we need and that we know we can, we can actually make possible. So thank you so much for coming on with us to help us to un unpuzzle a little bit of this. Jennifer and Tina, particularly to you too, because of your experience and how important it is for us to hear directly from you. And you honestly know so much about what, what the solutions are and what you've been experiencing. Uh, Andrew, great to see you on this forum. Happy to have a, a medical perspective and a, and a sort of integrated health perspective. Mayor Helps, always tremendous to see your leadership. Donnie, great to have a park steward with us, really critically important for us, we feel, to understand how people in your position are kind of navigating all the compromises. You have, we're, we all have Finland envy. People always end a city talk wanting to love some, some place more than their own. We all want to come to Finland. And Leilani, thank you for uh, helping us with this at the shift and making this dis discourse. I mean, as we always say at the end of a city talk, you know, the conversation has only just started. It hasn't finished. Uh, there's been tons of stuff on the chat here, folks, and people wanted the chat to even stay open longer. So Jamie tells me she can stay on a bit longer. So if you want to finish th things up, but we will publish the chat so you can see all the smart things that were put there and all the links and everything else. Uh, and this session will, of course, be posted also on City Talk. So thanks, folks for helping us to start to think about what are some alternative ways to address and learn from what encampments are teaching us and what all uh, this topic, why it's so critical to the future of cities. So thanks everybody for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Excellent facilitation, as always. Always. Thanks, Bye. Bye.